Well, um, so generals, like you, General Cavoli, General Andrzejczak, welcome on board the Peace Strategy Arc 2023. And the first question, very general uh, one, uh, after hearing the speeches of President of Poland and President Zelensky, uh, I think we should start from the question where we are in this war. We are following this war quite closely, as probably nobody else in, the, in this room. Um, where we are, where Ukrainians are is in this war, how this war is, is going in your view, in your view, you are, you are professionals, you are, are fighters, you are soldiers. Um, you know what's happening, you know, President, Z President Zelensky is saying that, you know, his speech, his, his recording can be interrupted by the missiles coming um, um, to Ki uh, in Kiev. They have, you know, a lot of work to do to fight with them. So how this war is going? General Cavoli. Let's solve that. <laughs> Let's go first. Um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, the arc of the war has been um, not entirely surprising, but brought some, some uh, um, moments that did surprise. Um, so in the beginning, it was clear that Russia massed a very large force, um, invaded Ukraine, and, um, and Ukraine staged what can only be described as a valiant uh, defense and uh, succeeded in pushing the Russians um, back from their initial gains. We settled into a long period last, last summer of um, stasis along the front, and then the Ukrainians undertook an offensive that was quite successful in liberating large parts of the Kharkiv region, um, as well as uh, half of Kherson Oblast. Um, and then things settled into the winter, and Russia clearly adopted a strategy of protracting the war and uh, endeavoring to enter into a war of attrition with Ukraine, which, in their opinion, would favor Russia, not, not Ukraine. Ukraine, on the other hand, has um, built additional units and um, has generated offensive capability. It has been done with a assistance of a remarkable voluntary coalition of, um, of countries, Poland chief among them. Uh, more than 50 countries attend the, um, the, the Ukraine donor coordination group or contact group. Um, and all of these countries came together and supplied uh, arms, but more important training to our Ukrainian colleagues. And those Ukrainian colleagues now have an offensive capability. And I think, uh, I think we'll see what they do with it. Thank you much. General Andrzejczak. Well, we see and we feel uh, the, the, the decisive point of the operation is coming. Uh, and I hope uh, it will be soon and it will be successful. But always like a close to Eastern theory, the fog of war. And we have to be very, very careful. Militarily, uh, I was mentioned, Chris, uh, we prepare um, great power and good compositional military instruments to uh, prevent uh, you know, Russian actions and also to take initiative for uh, offensive operation. But also the very important is that we are in decisive point uh, politically, morally, economically. So it requires a lot of efforts, not only military one, and I move the attention more widely to uh, everybody, absolutely, who cares. Uh, about the results of, of the war. So this is a decisive point of the, this war, I, I believe. Uh, General Jenczak, uh, Poland was, was the first country uh, that started to send hardware to Ukraine. Um, so I said in my introduction speech, the tempo is of the essence. What we have learned about our armaments, our weapons, uh, from uh, from you know uh, from Ukraine, uh, are they using our staff uh, in efficient way? 
or they're using very, very effectively. And this is a good uh, signal. I'll always say the half of my heart is, is, is crying when I'm sending equipment, but uh, the, the other one is very happy because my equipment is extremely effective. And, uh, and there's also the Ukrainian uh, opinion about the, the equipment they're receiving. But the lessons learned taken uh, are very long, you know, list of the things uh, we see every day. Uh, I would say the first of all, first lessons learned is um, that the war is a still natural Russian instrument of, of, you know, making politics. So this is the, you know, good reminder for us. And Russia still is doing the politics that way. So we have to remember. Second thing uh, is not only about equipment mentioned by you, but entire Ukrainian nation. Resilience as a state, resilience as a nation, resilience as a culture is absolutely crucial and critical. And we have to think widely how to improve our resilience uh, in, in Poland, in Eastern flank, and also in, in, in NATO and in Western, Western uh, civilization to be uh, much more effective, not only in the kinetic physical aspects, but also information domain and, and many others. So uh, uh, I see this war as a much, you know, more important and uh, for, for uh, not only for Poland, but for region and for, for the future. So list of the lessons that are taken is fortunately and unfortunately very long. Uh, General Cavoli, um, um, Ukrainians um, are getting more and more modern US equipment. Are we satisfied with the way how this equi equipment performs until now uh, on the battlefield? Sure. Um, I, I think when we look at the um, employment of weapon systems in Ukraine, we can divide it up into the quality of the weapons themselves and then the way that they are employed. Um, with regard to the quality of weapon systems themselves, I, th I think the main lesson is if you own Russian-built equipment, you should get rid of it as quickly as possible. Um, it's, it's simply not as effective. Um, Western arms have proven far, far superior. Um, the method of employment, though, is really the key. And the Ukrainians have proven unbelievably adept at quickly adopting new technologies to include technologies maybe not familiar to them or procedures not familiar, and employing them almost immediately um, on the battlefield. The training periods to, to, to train up on Leopard tanks or on um, the M1s that they're starting on um, this month, um, or even the Patriot system, the training periods were not long. They were quite abbreviated compared to the way we train our own soldiers. Um, so I really think it's not just the quality of Western arms, it's the combination with the ingenuity and the, uh, and the skill of the Ukrainian soldiers. We have just learned that, that Ukrainians managed to shoot down uh, a Russian supersonic missiles, Kinjal by Hypersonic. Hypersonic, hypersonic uh, um, uh, missiles uh, using Patriots. Um, you know, are, were you aware that we are, are able to do that? Uh, before um, the, the systems were had been provided to, to Ukrainians? Right, well, um, we, <laughs> we know that the system is very good. We're extremely happy that Poland has, has chosen um, the system along with some others. Um, but, you know, like we can't really speak publicly about exactly what we know about its exact capabilities. Um, but we were very pleased to see that report come out of Ukraine. Um, uh, General Andrzejczak, mm, uh, we know Russian way of war very well. I mean, sitting in, in, in the Central Europe, it is something uh, we are very much familiar with. Uh, Russians perform in Ukraine exactly the same tactics based on quantity. How we should think about our own defense? Uh, does it quality trumps quantity still? Uh, do we have enough um, equipment? Do we have enough ammunition? How we should think about defending ourselves against this kind of tactic, the, the, against the Russian way of war? So, well, first of all, uh, Poles, historically, we are not surprised about the performance of Russians because to, in being in the space for a pretty long time, 1,000 years, we, we remember everything. Not only, uh, you know, 1939 and then the cutting 
will happen the performance of a uh, you know red army in berlin and the same is uh, in afghanistan chechnya uh, syria uh, you know the poisoning um, nh17 and you know entire list including a very symbolical uh, small esque so w we're not surprised and the russians respect only only power and this is no question about it. They're talking about the quantity and quality. The first observation that I have from, from Ukraine, not everything is ready to translate into what we're doing because Ukraine still is not yet in NATO, but I, I hope will be soon. Uh, and also it's a slightly different geography and, and, and situation. So uh, talking about uh, you know, uh, quality and quantity, uh, there'll be a couple of interesting observations and fifth generation airplanes, uh, they are not in, in the combat. We are on the way. So in a, in a very short time, Poland will receive uh, F-35s, uh, the same Patriot, uh, which is really interesting, where we discuss with Chris. Um, space, cyber, uh, you know, autonomous platforms, ro robotic, you know, fights. In the, in, so not everything is the same. So we carefully observing um, situation in Ukraine and trying to design uh, army capable and also uh, uh, fit to the to the situation but in the end of the day really no matter how how many modern technology and, and the cyber issues and, and satellite pictures you have in the end of the day you need a tank you need the infantry you need artillery to prevent so the combination of quantity and quality is uh, is a critical uh, that what we'll say General Cavoli, you know, it's no surprise that Poles know very well how Russians are, are fighting and how Russia's way of war looks like. But what about other, uh, other allies? You are, you know, the commander of, of allied forces in Europe. So what about those nations um, uh, sitting of, away of, of, of this conflict? Well, I, I think just like Ryman said, Poland is doing all allies are studying this conflict extremely closely. And truth be told, most of our allies had been focused on um, the Russian military and the Russian way of war since 2014. Um, it may not have translated out into um, dramatic policy all the time or something, but the militaries have been fairly focused on it. I think to, to build off of what um, Ryman just said about quantity and quality, it's a very important question. Our Western um, theory for defeating Russian mass has always been to use precision to defeat the mass. And we do see in the uh, Ukrainian use of high-end systems that it, that it works. However, it takes time. And to gain that time, be, because if you hit the logistics system with precision weapons, it doesn't produce a change that day on the front. It's a downstream effect. And um, in order to gain the time, to let the precision beat the mass, typically you have to trade space. And, um, and when we see what's happened to the space that was traded in Ukraine, that's not something we want for, uh, for our allies or for anybody. And so I think there has to be a good balance of mass against mass combined with precision and quality um, to fight a deeper fight and erode it more quickly. W one without the other does not work very well. Uh you mentioned time, precision, but what about range? Uh, Brits has, uh, have just provided Ukraine with, with very precise long-range missile. Do you think it is going to be a game changer in this war? How this, how this exactly this uh, uh, weapon system can change the battlefield? So I, I think this is a, a super important question because we sometimes get get very fixed on the exact weapons or, or, the, um, or what has been given, what has not been given. Uh, there is no such thing as a game changer, right? I, I mean, it, it, everything has to work as a system. You have to be able to strike the enemy deep, middle, and close. You have to be able to do it simultaneously. You have to be able to find, otherwise it does no good to be able to strike. You have to be able to do everything. And it is much better to have pretty good capabilities that are holistic and integrated than it is to have one excellent capability that is not combined with other things. So I think that there, there is no silver bullet. There just has to be good, solid combinations of the equipment available. Yes, talking about holistic approach, uh, 
Ukrainians are getting ready for their counteroffensive. Um, can we? Can they be successful in this in this effort without air power? The question to General Andrzejczak, because you know they are lacking air power, and, and Russians are. Uh, still have uh, superiority in the air. So, uh, how, how to how to think about the holistic approach in counteroffensive without the power? It's not easy question. Uh, I would say the war is not only about equipment. I totally agree. There's no no Wunderwaffen. You know, we, we know it from uh, from history. Although it's very well known, the V1, V2, Tiger tanks, and uh, including elephants of Hannibal. So it, it doesn't work that way. So the strategy matters. And uh, to defeat an enemy, uh, going back to Sun Tzu, I'm not sure whether it will be a good quote because the, the quote is made in China. But, um, <laughs> but he said, uh, you have to break a will, you have to uh, destroy alliances, and then you have to beat the army. So Russians are not successful in breaking Ukrainian will. Whatever we do, we should support the, the, this element. So in empowering the will of fight and the imagination of victory. Second thing is breaking alliances. That's the good lessons that are taken. You cannot survive if you are alone. And I think Chris will never, in, in a couple of good years, the examples that presenting alliances matters. Support matters, friends matters, you know, credible uh, uh, neighbors. And the last is, is uh, breaking the uh, army. Uh, and I still believe that we sent enough for uh, this certain operational, you know, uh, situation. Uh, and I have a fully trust for uh, for performance of Ukrainian soldiers. But again, I would like to emphasize is more about the financial issues, economy, social aspects, and the support should be much wider, not only considering the uh, the military domain. Uh, General Cavoli, President Zelensky mentioned in, in his address to the strategic arc fighting Falcons, F-16s. Um, do you think that, that Ukrainian fighters would be um, able to use it quickly? Or because, you know, uh, as we, uh, uh, we read assessment that actually to train uh, fighting pilot, we, you need two to, to five years. They don't have so, you know, uh, uh, so much time. Uh, when this uh, fighting Falcons uh, um, uh, can do the difference on the battlefield in Ukraine? Yeah, well, clearly um, it's much easier for the Ukrainian side to adopt MiG-29s um, from Poland or from Slovakia. Um, because the pilots are already trained, but much more important, the maintenance systems, the logistic systems appropriate for that airframe are already in place. So uh, to use modern air power, it's an entire system of systems um, that involves highly trained people on the ground, not just in the cockpit. There are a lot of things. So it's not an easy thing to put together. It's much easier to add to an existing system, which has been the approach so far. But I'd like to go back to the, to the question of what's the, what, what's the point? The point is that in a war, a side needs to control its airspace so that its airspace can't be used to attack its soldiers. And there are many ways to control the airspace. You can control the airspace from the ground. In fact, the Russians have never not one day during this entire conflict established air superiority. Um, that's because of um, ground-based air defenses from the Ukrainians. You also want to use the air to strike the enemy. The Ukrainians have been doing that in unbelievably innovative ways with drones, many of the drones produced by themselves. Um, so, so it's the question is part of a much larger complex of how to wage the war. And it goes back to the fact that there's no wonder weapon. There's all systems that, that have to be employed as systems. Uh, next question is about the adaptation of your structures. I mean, your headquarters, your um, uh, combat chain, uh, command chains. So, Gunnar uh, and uh, how Polish armed forces have adapted to to the experience of, of, of the battlefield in Ukraine. What has changed in, in your headquarter? There was a lot of, a lot of changes, it's still dynamic, we're observing, uh, very important. Uh, uh, in, a, in a couple of, of weeks, we're going to 
you know, the politically we're going to the Vilnius uh, NATO summit, there will be a lot of uh, important decision and then going to the uh, uh, John Cavoli office as well and the uh, uh, new force model, so the executability of uh, the plans. So we're considering most of the uh, issues are, are classified, so uh, please give us a time. But uh, we see a lot of uh, good dynamics, how to improve uh, the structure in the strategical level, but also going down to the certain national domain and, and Polish army, what we're doing. Uh, just related to the range you mentioned uh, and, and our ability for long range fires. Uh, we're just receiving, uh, you know, the F-35s coming coming soon and uh, the Prime Minister Morawiecki was in state, uh, states and talking about the long, uh, long range uh, you know, systems. So it's uh, absolutely uh, going in a, in a good direction, but uh, momentum and speed is, is a critical. So uh, I'm, I'm really touched that most of the most useful word to uh, last night and 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 today is is speed is is momentum is time time time, time factor is, is critical it's not not everything about what we're doing and how big the support is numbers but the proper timing is crucial talking about time uh how much a shape has changed how much time uh, you devote to follow? A little bit more busy, I think. Follow, <laughs> <laughs> follow the battleground and what's happening in Ukraine. So, um, while it's very hard to overstate the changes in the military structures of the alliance right now, so coming out of Madrid last year, um, there was um, there was political direction to Sakir to complete a family of plans. And so we have just um, turned in um, regional plans that are the first time in more than 30 years that the Alliance has objective plans, militarily sound plans to defend every part of the Alliance. Um, this is a huge advance because it allows us to drive many things. Every single inch. Every inch, Poland. Or centimeter with same <laughs> Poland. <laughs> um, so this drives, this drives a lot, right? First of all, it drives a force structure requirement. Once you have plans in place, you know how many forces easily. So we've, we, you know, we've talked about 2% for years. Now we actually have plans-based capabilities targets that we can develop that will help nations guide their national defense investment plans. Um, um, and so we can be focused by the right things, combine current possibilities and current capabilities with future capabilities in the right patterns. So that's the first thing. The second thing is it drives new readiness requirements, right? If you have plans and indications and warnings, you have different readiness requirements and a different regimen of studying and evaluating readiness. The third thing, it'll bring changes in command and control. You asked about what's changed in shape. Shape is changing back into a war fighting headquarters that is capable of managing and directing operations through three major subordinate commands, the Joint Force Commands in Brunson, Norfolk, and Naples, to deliver military effects inside areas of responsibility that are established and approved. These are just massive changes, and they will have a very, very good effect on national defense planning, too, because they combine with national defense plans. Um, so there's a huge amount changing inside our headquarters and uh, and every place else. But as you know, General Andrzejczak said, speed is everything, right? So we need to get these plans into place and executable with assigned forces, properly manned headquarters, and all of the systems exercised before before Russia reemerges from this uh, conflict and decides to threaten NATO again. Yeah. I will come back to to uh, to, to the planning thing, uh, but uh, General Cavoli, you mentioned that shape is actually in a kind of the war mode already. Uh, what we are hearing from the Russian leaders, from passages from coming from the Kremlin and, and Moscow is that Russia is at war with the West. Russia is at war with NATO. Uh, so I, I would like to ask General Andrzejczak first, are we at the war with Russia? Well, Russia is permanently at war. Russia is in war in high intensity, low intensity, new generation, cyber hybrid, political energy, 
So this is the state of mind of Russians to, to be at war and, and using uh, any kind of assets and with predominantly uh, the, you know, uh, um, military instruments of power. The, the question is, you, you, can, you can answer both way, let's say, uh, and according to law not, this is not NATO war with Russia. And uh, if, you, if you're going a little bit higher with the much more philosophical question, I would say, well, uh, my tanks and my artillery pieces are, are fighting effectively. Eight million Ukrainians crossed the border and some of them still living in Poland. A lot of investments uh, we, we're doing. So this is a very good question for everybody. How do you feel? How do you really feel? Do you really want to win? I, I was really touched last night when Professor Cohen he quoted uh, the John Paul II, being here in Warsaw uh, and being American, he said, uh, do not afraid. At the square. Absolutely, and, and that, that was the, the sentence, uh, the, you know, and I said, well, do not afraid to think about the victory, do not afraid of, of uh, fight, and do not afraid uh, to, to win, because Russia is, is beatable in, in that war. In that war. Just a comment for the audi audience, don't be afraid uh, you didn't attend the, um, the um, speech, um, the lecture given by Professor Cohen. Uh, the speech is going to be published, will be, is going to be available for the general public, so don't worry, you will, you will, you will get it. No, I'd like to answer the same question from the alliance-wide perspective. However, the answer is no. NATO is not at war with Russia, and it's a mischaracterization from the Russian side to claim that. All of the plans I just described are defensive plans because NATO has always been a defensive alliance. So um, SHAPE is not at war. SHAPE is in the business of conducting active deterrence measures. That is what I'm instructed to do right now, is to provide deterrence across the entire alliance. So the, Russia, the, the one sentence, uh, Slavik, Russia would like to have a, such a narrative that we are yes. in a war, because it works for Russians. So the, in, in that context, we say no. But still, it's very much important question how much we, so, you know, supporting Ukraine and the, all of those efforts. If we morally are engaged and and, and supporting in every kind kind of uh, the activity, there'll be there'll be good uh, intellectual exercise for everybody. Talking about defense, NATO is moving from a strategy um, of uh, deterring Russia, Russia by the punishment towards the strategy based on deterring Russia by denial. How much difference um, uh, does it make for shape, for you generals, for you, um, Raymond, to move from one strategy to another? What's the difference? Well, uh, if, if, if I could start, the, the difference in a military sense is you have to move um, forces to the point of need faster. Right, they either have to be there, but that's very difficult because we now have more than 3,000 kilometers of frontage with Russia, which is a named adversary of, of NATO. So, so it's hard to predict exactly what the correct location to forward station forces is. But you also have to have them able to move to the point of need very quickly at the time of need, and that time distance factor is the biggest challenge of moving from one modus to the other. It's got a lot to do with things like military mobility, which you know we've been talking about for years, improving the trafficability of our routes, improving the procedures to get from one country to another, making sure our ports are owned by friendly corporations or governments and not adversaries or potential adversaries, and all of that feeds into this. The simplest, simplest answer would be not Bucha anymore. No way. So we don't want to wait until the, any kind of... Uh, the, the Russian forces penetration and going deep into Poland and then defending and, and preparing counterattacks. The change of philosophy is to build as effective, as credible system that attack would not be possible. That's the, the, the most important message we would like to send. No Bucha anymore. Okay, but what does it mean in practice? How close to the, to the border uh, you would like to have your forces? Uh, because it's about range, it's about the time, but you know, both, both our, our criteria are interconnected. Yeah. You know, closer they are, uh, faster you can react. So, uh, uh, is it enough to have them, I don't know, in West Germany, or you would prefer to have them somewhere in the Baltic States or in Poland? 
Well, uh, there, there has to be a balance. And when I talk about my forces, I'm talking about all the forces in the alliance. There has to be a balance between Ford defense, and typically that's going to be accomplished by nations, right? Article 3 comes before Article 5. Um, and so typically nations will establish the Ford defense, and other nations that aren't on the front line will be need to be in a position where they're very ready, highly mobile, and placed for agility. And so it depends plan by plan where exactly that is, but it's a combination of a, of a balanced stance. So uh, the answer is easy, more troops closer to, uh, to the borders, uh, credible forces with the capability to engage in the, in the big distances, but also new capabilities, space, cyber, but then, again, I would like to emphasize it's not only about the numbers of brigades and tanks, it's also about the production of ammunition, it's about resilience of the state, awareness, uh, and, uh, and the peacetime orientation, crisis you know, uh, effectiveness, and then finally we're going to the, to the military. But uh, it's much more important, and Ukraine uh, is effective not, because, not only because the the brave performance of uh, Ukrainian soldiers by the entire nation is fighting. And, and the, the alliance and nations have moved forces farther east in response to this conflict. Um, Poland, of course, creating the 18th Armored Division. Um, that's going to be a very big deal. There are four new multinational NATO battle groups since last year um, in frontline states. Other nations have increased their force structure and placed it closer to the borders. So I think there's been a significant movement to fight a large, large fight like we see in Ukraine, though. It's going to require a large reinforcement, and it's my job to make that fast in conjunction with nations. Okay, but uh, it's also about the size of, of the force uh, you would like to have. It's, it's you know, about time, about range, but also quantity. So um, how big a uh, um, force you would like to have to effectively deter Russia, to effectively Im Im implement the strategy of, of uh, deterrence by denial? Because, you know, den this deterrence can be credible and can be not credible. Right. So uh, you need to convince uh, the opponent uh, that first you will be quick enough, uh, you will be precise enough, you will be close enough, but also that you will have enough troops, enough ammunition. So how to do that? How big force you would like to have, General? So if you're asking soldiers, the answer will be never enough, <laughs> more. <laughs> But of course, we have to keep the balance between 3% uh, of GDP we're investing and you know, money uh, and all of the uh, implications with the with economy and demography. So the keeping balance, uh, th that's what I said in the very beginning, it's not only Poland, it's uh, you know, uh, the alliance is NATO, and we would like to be an inspiration for, for everybody else. And, and I think uh, uh, we, we should consider not only numbers, but also capabilities, the new, the coming, you know, multi-domain concepts, space and cyber. And also uh, it's important to understand that uh, defense of Poland starts in the education of very, very young, you know, uh, the, the people, Poles, and about awareness, about the support, relations, trust, and alliances. So uh, I, I, will, I will keep for a while the numbers of brigades and we'll finally we, we, with John Cavoli, we, we synchronize in the plans, but the soldiers' answer will be never enough. Give me more. So, so we have delivered a force structure requirement based on, um, based on our plans. It's not public, of course, yet. Nations are considering it, um, but it will be one of the drivers of the NATO defense planning process, which establishes the capabilities targets that nations then use um, to, uh, to help design their forces. It's entirely doable, the size of the force structure requirement we have. We can do it. The Alliance has a big military force when it assembles it all together. Um, it, it, part of the question is making it available um, to allied command operations for operations. This is one of the reasons that the regional plans began with host nation defense plans so that we could optimize and maximize the use of troops across the Alliance. But I think, I th I think we'll have uh, We'll have some growing to do in some areas especially. I think if we look at our logistics and sustainment capabilities, nation by nation, we have some work to do. I think if we look at our ground-based air defense systems, we'll probably grow a lot there. Um, but all these will be decisions that nations have to take as, as, as we go forward. But they're all entirely doable.
Okay, uh, General, you mentioned uh, capabilities. Uh, so let me mention General Bonaparte. Uh, you know, we both uh, know his way of war, war very well. We mentioned his name in our national item that Bonaparte showed us how to fight. Um, I, I know that Anglo-Saxons Anglo had a different view about him, but, but just for... I'm actually of Italian heritage. <laughs> but <laughs> but, but uh, uh, just for, for um, um, you know, as a point of departure, Bonaparte says that uh, uh, three things he needs to fight the war, money, money, money. General Zawuzny, who actually was invited to, to join this panel, but you know, uh, last week he told us, "Sorry, guys, uh, you know, I have to, I have a war to win," so he, he was unable to uh, to, to be here. Uh, but uh, in one of his conversation, uh, conversations, public conversation, he said that uh, he needs three things: ammunition, ammunition, ammunition. So about uh, our capabilities. Uh, are we doing enough to have enough ammunition, ammunition, ammunition? Because money, I think money is, is you know, the, the issue of money is getting better and better. I mean, uh, our countries in, in at least in, in NATO eastern flank are, are spending more than, uh, than uh, the, the pledged adopted in, 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 the, in the world. So what about the ammunition? How, how we could, uh, you know, convince uh, the public that it's not only be, it's not only be, it's not only about uh, uh, precision. It's not about weapons. It's not about uh, quantity of troops, but about ammunition, about logistics. How how to do this? Well, I, I was I was studying close to Brno in the Czech Republic, and there's a small village called Slavkov Slavkov Ubrna, which is Austerlitz. So I studied carefully. And Napoleon also said uh, the morale factor is, is um, you know, multiplicates uh, the physical aspect. So money is important, but he, he said as well that what we have in our, you know, hearts and minds is even more important. But anyway, going to the material world, um, there was a huge change right now. It's not about money. Uh, we, we got a money, but it's a time again, time, how to change production and our effectiveness. It was a huge discussion. I've been to to U.S. and I was talking to General Milley as well. How to change our effectiveness in production? Because war in Ukraine is a war of uh, of attrition. Russian army, the speed of attrition is is too slow, and speed of attrition in Ukraine as a state and as an army is very high. We cannot accept. So we we change a lot of things. Is a, you can find in the programs of uh, Mr. President uh, and Prime Minister m many uh, governmental decision about to invest and to increase our uh, capability in the production as well as uh, European Union efforts, but also in the bilateral uh, relations as well. So there was a huge change. I think the the biggest in NATO, but still again, time is uh, is a, is a, is a crucial. So send of time is running low. So there, the promises of money are largely there, the intention to spend, the money's beginning to flow in most nations, um, but it's got to go someplace. And industry is, um, I industry is not absorbing the uh, investments and producing as quickly as we would hope. Um, I can say that pretty evenly across the, uh, the, the Western world. Uh, so this question of industrial capacity as an essential part of our ability to wage war is fundamental. Um, and it is something that has atrophied and needs to come back. And a case in point is ammunition. Um, our plans um, are also driving a new ammunition stockpile requirement. But I have no illusions that it will be like a light switch where we declare the requirement, somebody pulls out a checkbook, and now it's fulfilled. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time because uh, industry has to reestablish capacity. The capability is there, but the capacity in some cases is not as elastic as we would hope. Uh, just one uh, uh, housekeeping comment. Uh, both our speakers, generals, have agreed to take few questions. So, uh, on the topic, on the way of helping of, of Ukraine. So, um, you can uh, start thinking about your questions. Uh, now, I would like to come back to, to my uh, great panelists, uh, generals, and ammunition. 
um, um, there is a lot of talk in the United States, in public, that U.S. Army, U.S. Armed Forces don't have enough ammunition to help uh, Ukraine, that this, this assistance should stop because there is a, um, a part contingency in the Pacific and um, uh, you are running out of stocks um, and you know, helping Ukraine too much may expose the United States to the, to the other challenges, other threats. Uh, how you read this kind of debate? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, that debate is not limited to the United States, right? I, I hear it in, in many other nations as well. Well, in the United States, I can't speak for all other nations, but in the United States, um, we work very carefully to examine the Ukrainians' requests, their needs, their requirements as we understand them, and also the readiness requirements of U.S. armed forces. And based on sort of that three-way combination of factors, we, we determine how much and what, what we can give. Um, but I would say that up to this point, using those three criteria, um, there, there is still ammunition flowing and there are still weapons flowing. So, uh, so we should take some confidence from that. Uh, General Andrzejczak, we have just heard that, that there are plans to build a new um, factory uh, you know, for production ammunition in, in Poland, uh, also for HIMARS and our, um, other uh, stuff. Uh, do we think about only about NATO, about uh, NATO eastern flank, or we think about these new capabilities uh, in more uh, as our contribution to to allied effort, allied capabilities, free world capabilities, uh, because there are other contingencies that uh, these capabilities may be needed. Well, uh, the, the, what we see in the Ukraine right now is, is probably a bigger thing that we could imagine in, in a couple of months or a couple of years before. If we're losing Ukraine, which is absolutely out of my imagination, can you imagine our investments when the when the Russian army will be, you know, uh, in in Belarus and Brest and in Lviv and anywhere else? So for those that don't believe and they have a slightly relaxed mood, I would say, well, let's imagine such a situation. This is everybody's business. And uh, talking about the U.S., I, I'm not, you know, responsible for Taiwan and all of those challenges you're facing every day. But um, uh, certain uh, and critical Polish capabilities are coming from South Korea, tanks and artillery. So if we're not helping, you know, collectively, U.S. solve some of the problems, there will be a huge, you know, change in th that kind of geometry. So this is the, the, people say the regional conflict, but I would say it's a global, global challenge. Everybody's in the business and everybody has something to do concerning, for, for example, ammunition. Okay. Uh, NATO summit in Vilnius is ahead of us. Um, so I will ask uh, both of you generals, what do you expect? What do you like to hear from the leaders uh, in, you know, gather in Vilnius in, you know, beginning of July? What kind of the directive and decisions would like to, to see uh, uh, there to help you to build this deterrence uh, credible enough to mobilize our, our potential and to protect our societies, because you are doing this job on the first line. You, you are not doing this job just to train troops. You are on the first line of shielding our societies against the threats coming from the East. So what you would like to hear from our leaders in the Vilnius Summit? So I'm not a politician, active duty soldier, so I'm waiting for, uh, for mission and for, for uh, tasks from my, my subordinates, but I would say, uh, we need decisions, uh, the common uh, decision to sending message to Russia that uh, enough means enough. Uh, of course, uh, all of the um, elements supporting mention uh, new force model, the adaptation of NATO. Uh, the, our guidance is clear. We, we need more authority to the soccer, which will be a measurement of our effectiveness. If he knows uh, what's going on, he got our authority to to observe uh, indication and warnings, we will be much more effective in deterrence and defense. So that, that's our, our message. Um, well, obviously, like 
Ryman, I don't want to get ahead of our political leaders. They have enough, enough on their mind. They don't need an amateur to help them. Um, on, on the other hand, um, I think one of the important things that, that could be done at Vilnius is the full adoption of the plans, the family of plans, and all of the consequential things. This is all about adapting NATO. I think it's clear that there are other more political decisions that are going to be on the table. Defense investment pledges, our relationship with Ukraine, um, Sweden, um, and, and other things like that. But the one that matters, you know, as a purely military matter is to get the plans into place, to get everybody to agree that they're going to fulfill the plans and make them executable this year. Thank you very much. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, I open the floor for questions. Uh, please introduce yourself uh, first. Thank you very much indeed. Benjamin Tallis, German Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, thank you, generals, for an enlightening conversation. I, I want to push a little bit further, though. The function of the alliance traditionally has been at least twofold. One, to provide capabilities. The second, to ensure our collective will to fight. I think it's fair to say that in both fields, which are interconnected, it's an unevenness across the alliance. It's stronger in some places than others. How do we ensure, taking what uh, General Andrejchuk said as a whole of society approach, that we actually stiffen that collective will to fight in order that we don't have to, we may argue, if deterrence is successful, but how do we increase that and what would be good indicators or demonstrations of that? Thank you. Well, I, th I think Elliot uh, Cohen pointed out a couple of good things last night. The role of public intellectuals such as yourself in persuading nations and populations of the importance of a will to fight. Um, you might describe the will to fight as uneven across the alliance. I, I'm putting words in your mouth, but I think that's, that's what you're saying. But um, I, I look at it again, is the glass half empty, half full? There is a more unified will in the alliance than I have seen in 36 years of service. Um, I have never seen the level of unanimity and, um, and, and unity as we see now and for the past year. And I, I really mean that sincerely. As I travel around, I hear people fear about it, you know, but we could lose the unity. But when I go to capitals and consult with uh, political leaders, when I sit in Brussels, I just don't hear the lack of unity. It's, it's an amazing thing. So I'm very gratified by it. But of course, building more unity and sustaining unity is always critical. And I think sessions like this have a lot to do with uh, our ability to do that because it's about persuading our populations of the importance of the issues. Well, a good question. But uh, if you ask in Polish here in Warsaw, I would say uh, in any kind of level. So. Uh, um, what the President Duda is saying, you, you saw a couple of seconds before relations and uh, his contribution and an and effort to, to do. Uh, also government, uh, in the social domain, you saw the, the Polish performance from the very beginning. In the military domain, training, maintenance, and authentic equipment. So that, that what we're doing and we are second donator. Uh, what we would like to do is, as, the, as Chris mentioned, is much wider uh, discussion for intellectuals, for media, for those who are active in the in the debate, to just to just to take care about the, what we're doing and what we see. Not only is a good question, but but you know, probably not only for me. Thank you very much, Anton Laguardia of the Economist. Um, General Andrejczak, you spoke about this being a decisive moment, a decisive point in the war. Can you explain that in? Uh, in clearer terms, and what do you see, what do both of generals see coming afterwards? Which, uh, what happens after the counteroffensive? Uh, is there talking, is there talking and fighting? What, what, what scenarios do you envisage? And which side has the advantage in a long war if this drags on beyond this year? So, well, Decisive, decisive point of the operation of war, but uh, I would like to mention again, uh, war starts as a political act and ends as a political act. So uh, this, is, this is a part of the, the bigger, um, bigger mechanism. If the uh, operational and militarily they are successful, then this, we need some translation into the political, political language, so a, probably not a question uh, for us. And, uh, uh, well, uh, that, that would be my answer. I would agree with him. 
Okay. Thanks, Slavik, um, and thanks, Generals, for a great panel. Uh, Mick Ryan, a fellow at the CSIS and, and a couple other institutions. Um, I want to talk about people. Uh, we've talked a lot about the uh, 30 years of degradation of defence industry in the West, but at the same time we were doing that, we were actually making our military forces smaller and exquisitely professional. Now, that's been a good thing up until now. Um, has Ukraine shown us that we need to move beyond the all-volunteer, all-professional forces to an expandable, mobilised organisation in Western military institutions? And do you think military institutions and the political class are up for that shift? I, I think it's a great question. I would never dare to answer it in front of a chief of defense who's actually responsible for things like that. I am, I am blessedly just the beneficiary of, of the, the forces that chiefs of defense produce. I would simply observe that across the alliance, a number of allies have examined this question of returning to conscription or a broader basis of providing manpower, and many have adopted, or some have adopted, um, uh, non-voluntary systems. Well, I wouldn't be so reactive if we see any challenge to immediately we're going back to some points of reference from history and implement uh, like a you know, uh, Cold War time to zero uh, structure. In Poland, we have a fully professional uh, operation, uh, operational troops as well as a territorial defense, new form of uh, linking the social uh, you know, activity, I mean, working and, and being a soldier as well as voluntary conscriptions. Uh, one of the reasons that I've been to, to Finland and Sweden was uh, also observing how they approach. But again, it's, it's, it's not only about the numbers of the troops, but the awareness of society. So I would say the good combination of active component and then reserve forces or active reserve, territorial defense, volunteers, and any other uh, elements would, would be the answer. I wouldn't go back to the um, you know 70s and and conscription and uh, half million of army will be solution for uh, combat effectiveness. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are run off uh, um, out of time, so uh, there is uh, nothing to do more. But I would like to um, um, all of you to join me in rising applause for our great leaders, great soldiers, and great protectors of our freedom and our values. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.